Joining us right now to talk about the impact of those higher yields on the banking sector is Scott Seifers. He is senior bank analyst at Piper Sandler. And uh, Scott, we had these huge concerns back in March when things really started picking up, when rates went higher. We've calmed down a bit. We, we, we thought things were better, but the, the rate picture continues to climb. Yields continue going up. What does that mean for the banks? Yeah, good question, Becky, and thanks for, for having me. So, you know, if you if you can believe it, we're only about 15 percent up from those uh, those spring lows. So I think investors just have the sense that we're just sort of rolling from one concern to, one, to another. The latest concern is, of course, the impact of higher rates and how long they might stay here. So we, we tend to think about rate ramifications in four major buckets. So first is they simply simply exacerbate funding pressures. You know, if somebody can get five and a half percent on a, on a three month treasury, it's tough to keep that money in a bank account earning less. So banks are going to be forced to continue to raise their, their own costs of funds just to keep and attract uh, customers. And then, you know, second, banks, of course, hold a lot of bonds. When rates go up, the value of those bonds declines and uh, banks are left holding paper losses. So for the most part, those should be transitory losses and not, not really really matter, uh, fingers crossed. Um, but the the bank, the bonds that banks own are money good, so we just need to give them time to pull to par. But, you know, it's the kind of thing that hurts your liquidity and capital in the interim. So it's a it's an unfortunate thing that investors have to deal with. Um, you know, the third thing is that higher rates exacerbate loan growth issues. We've known for some time that banks are pulling in the reins on loan supply as they work to build their capital. But, you know, with higher rates, there are, of course, fewer incentives to borrow because the cost to, to do so is higher. So now we've just got both supply and demand issues on the on the lending side, and then finally, rate finally the the higher rates go, and the longer they stay there, the greater the risk that we enter a credit cycle. You know, you simply can't raise rates by several hundred basis points this quickly and avoid ca avoid causing some some pain along the way. So we're already seeing sort of what I would call discrete or one off credit issues, but you know, at some point, there's just the fear that those uh, those persist a little more broadly than we've seen so far. Would you steer people away from the financials at this point? Is, is there a section like the regionals that you're more concerned about? Yeah, you, you bet. So that's that's a good question. I'd say for right now, you know, the the safer play has been to be in what I would call the universals, you know, the the larger names, and that looks like it'll continue to work. And in particular, when I say the universals, what I'm largely referring to is J.P. Morgan. You know, it's just been an excellent name. It's got an excellent credit profile, uh, very very conservative outlook, has the strongest in capital liquidity in the space, and of course, it's got the best profitability with which to continue to build capital throughout all this uh, all this sort of turmoil. So it's just been an excellent place to hide and I think as long as there's all this uncertainty we're going to we're going to stick with JP Morgan as as sort of our go-to in the largest area. You know, in the Do you have a price target? Like Do you have a price target on JP Morgan? Uh, yeah, I can't recall it off the top of my head. Uh, it's of course higher than we are now. I'm just afraid I don't have it at my fingertips. But okay. you know, in the regional space, there's going to be there are going to be more uh, more issues, of course, because you're you're seeing more transformation there um, with all the new regulatory stuff. Um, but we like Cincinnati-based Fifth Third. Um, I, I consider that sort of a straight down the middle play. Um, you know, very deft interest rate positioning, really conservative assumptions. They'll meet new regulatory uh, requirements very very quickly, and in in our view, they've got a great risk profile as well. So so there are there are places where you can pick you can pick your spots, and we think uh, we think investors will do very well over time. Back in in March, things broke because rates rose so quickly. It happened kind of at a, a fast pace. We've got the mm -hmm. VIX back up. You've got interest rates ticking higher, or the yields ticking higher, uh, pretty consistently here. Is there a point that you worry things get broken again? Have we fixed any of the problems that were there underlying before? Yeah, you bet. So another great question. You know, while those were very abrupt and sort of chaotic problems, I think we're in the process of fixing them. For example, we've gotten a lot of new regulatory proposals on capital, on long-term debt. We're still waiting some on liquidity. So the thankful thing in my mind is that the regulators are giving banks a long runway to uh, uh, to meet these new requirements. So you're not going to see, in all likelihood, broad-based forced capital raises that would really spook investors. So I think that's a that's a good thing. But the thing that we watch most is really the the macro backdrop. You know, if we end up breaking the um, the employment market, that's going to be a problem because to date, consumers have stayed really healthy and much more so than you would have figured given this abrupt change in rates. So to the extent that we've got a, a potential credit cycle on the horizon, that's the thing that really spooks investors most right now. So that's that's probably what we're watching most closely.